We're launching the book Debating Multiculturalism, Should There Be Minority Rights by Peter Bolint and Paddy Tamil Leonard. Um, and we will hear from Paddy first, who can then introduce the book for us and then um, give us her um, viewpoint. Um, uh, everyone, let's just welcome Paddy. Um, hi, everyone. I'm delighted to be here and also to introduce this book. And I'm actually the, pe the best part about this is that Peter's entire family appears to be, appears to be here. So in case you thought that he was right, I can confirm, um, having worked with him for years, that he's wrong about everything. Um, and I will try to give you an account of why that is in the next 10 minutes. Um, so, uh, so, so, okay, so then I can say a little bit about the book uh, while Kim tries to get online. Um, so if you were paying attention to this, but why would you be? Because this is what Peter and I um, are, are attentive to. It's, um, it's about, about 10 years ago, there was, sort of a, there was sort of a multiculturalism is bad news. So all of these European leaders came out forward saying multiculturalism had failed and that it should be abandoned. Um, and they cited all these kinds of statistics saying that immigrants in various major European cities failed to integrate, that they failed to achieve educational, various kinds of educational, um, objectives, they didn't go to university, they failed to join the labor market, the children didn't learn English, people weren't integrating and so on. So it, all of these alleged harms, all of these things about immigrants to various mainly European cities were said to be because of multiculturalism. The claim was that multiculturalism and however it was instantiated in politics resulted in the failure of immigrants to integrate in various ways. So. I don't have time to say to explain why I think this. I think the evidence for the claim was wrong. I think that the uh, that there was failure to integrate, but that it was largely caused by European cities' unwillingness to allow immigrants into the labor market, to recognize foreign credentials, to admit them into higher um, spaces of higher education, and so on. So I think that the I think that the facts were correct. There was a failure of integration, but the cause was not multiculturalism. And I'm happy to expand on that in case that turns out to be something you'd like to talk about. But those kinds of debates prompted Peter and I to have a conversation about, uh, as it were, debating multiculturalism. Um, and I will leave um, Peter to say uh, why he thinks that uh, minority rights are not something that's essential um, or important in a, in a, in a diverse and democratic state. And we'll say only that I think the fundamental disagreement that we have and, and um, uh, we can probe this if you'd like, the sort of the fundamental disagreement that the two of us have is about whether culture really is important both in the private and public lives of minorities, uh, immigrant minorities and longstanding minorities in general. So my view is that culture is extraordinarily important to the individuals who participate in it, who have cultural practices. And therefore it's something that we should take seriously in the public sphere. People's cultural practices happen in private sometimes, but they also happen in public. And so it's a mistake to think that we can we can sort of relegate them to the public space, to the private space, or that that's where they ought to be treated best. So, all right. So I think that's the, I think that's the locus of disagreement. And, and then what we do with the sort of, I think culture is extraordinarily important. And I think Peter thinks it's um, less publicly important um, is what we explore in this book. So um, multicultural accommodations, again, I, I mean, I don't even, um, I don't know who I'm talking to. So I don't know whether I can just talk about them and assume that you know what they are, but there are a whole range of policies in, in diverse states, uniform accommodations, the permission to wear veils or saris in hospitals and courtrooms and so on. They are the willingness to provide kosher or halal or vegetarian or vegan food in school cafeterias. They are the willingness of the state to, to fund um, uh, cultural practices, cultural celebrations. They are indigenous self-determination, I include in this, in, this, um, in this cluster. They are the willingness of employers of schools to give holidays that are wide ranging or flexibility to individuals who have non-standard or non-majoritarian um, non holidays. Um, like Peter, my background is Jewish, so I'm always taking off a you know, Jewish New Year in September and my kids have to take it off. And, and so there's questions of, of how um, accommodating organizations are to those kinds of things. All right, so um, why do I defend them? Um, I defend all of them. I, I am very broad minded about what counts and why and the fact that they should be accommodated. And the, and the reason is very, um, it's not a very complicated one, actually. I think, um, so if you're looking for deep philosophy and I'm not gonna provide it because I just think that the reason that we want to accommodate all of these things is because in a democratic state, the thing that we value the most is political inclusion. That what we want is for everybody in our state 
who's a citizen, and I would include residents, but that's something else for, a, for possibly for a different space, should have uh, should be able to have their voice heard in, in decision-making spaces. And in order for minorities, whether they're longstanding or whether they're uh, newly arrived, to have an actual voice in those spaces, in many cases, in fact, I, I claim in, in one of my chapters, in an early chapter, in all cases, the reason that we need to do it is because we care about political inclusion and securing voice. So all of those accommodations that I just mentioned and all the others that you can think of, I think we should defend them for because we are committed to political inclusion. So that's one sort of chunk of the book. That's one thing that I, one argument that I make, uh, that I make. A second, a se so then, a, then another thing, some people say in response to this, well, look, not all minority groups desire integration or political inclusion. Some of them want cultural preservation. They wanna make sure that there's space to, to protect um, and to preserve their culture. And so they'll point to, they'll point to communities that prefer to be insular, um, communities that, um, in, often indigenous communities in the Canadian context, and I assume also in the Australian context, um, and so on. And I want to—I actually, uh, in a, in another chapter, and again, I can argue, I can I can ex explore any of this if you'd like. If you'd like to hear me, or maybe you all know Peter better, and you only want to hear what he has to say. That's okay too. He's very smart, although wrong. Um, uh, so then you might say, then I say in that, well, look, um, nevertheless, even in these claims of, of cultural preservation, where communities want to preserve an independent space in which they can practice cult various kinds of cultural practices, traditions, and so on, even in those kinds of cases, um, we should think about those in terms of political inclusion. And in the book, I consider three cases. One is indigenous self-determination. Another is ethnically segregated schools, which sometimes people think are about immigrants or newcomers or longstanding minorities trying to segregate themselves. But I argue, I make an argument saying that I think um, ethnically segregated schools are typically about giving confidence to students who have been um, on the margins of society or from communities that are on the margins of society. And so they're about giving space and confidence to these students so that they too can have join the, the political space. Um, and I say the same thing about the willingness of, of central governments to fund ethnically exclusive organizations. Um, in many countries, for example, just as one example, um, governments will fund um, ethnic organizations that are in a particular language, either in, in the in Urdu or in Punjabi and so on. And I think that these kinds of the willingness to fund media in these kinds of spaces are all about trying to include politically people who, whose language um, in your case and my case is not um, dominantly English. So, so I make that case that, that most arguments about cultural preservation are also about and should be defended from the perspective of political inclusion. And in the final chapter of the book, um, I look at cases where it's definitely clear that what the community wants is segregation. And in this case, I could talk about the examples, but um, one that is both recent and close to my heart is the, is the sort of, is the desire of, of very orthodox communities in New York City, in Toronto, uh, in many European cities to, to be exclusive, to, to live a culturally, religiously uh, pure life and to live it Outside of the outside of society, on the margins in general, and in that case, I think, well, look, what what does political? If we're committed to political inclusion, uh, which I am, what would we say to these kinds of cases? And and because I proceed in, in each of the chapters through case examples, in that particular case, I look at how New York State dealt with Orthodox communities during the COVID crisis. And for those of you who are paying any attention to this, which I guess I assume is nobody um, on this call um, uh, meeting is that what happened is um, the Orthodox Jewish communities absolutely categorically refused to participate in any of the COVID protection measures that were recommended. So there were uh, requests to restrict numbers of people in indoor spaces. There were requests to eventually to take vaccines, but they refused all of them. They said, they said in response, look, to be Jewish, orthodoxly Jewish, fundamentally Jewish, is to have uh, um, have religious ceremonies with 10 people, with 2,000 people, like, depending on what it is, and they were absolutely refusing on religious grounds to give that up. So the, the New York State, New York State's government went in with the police and broke them up, broke up all of these organized, all of these extremely important cultural events. And the claim that I make in that section is fundamentally that what that did was set back any prospect for additional political inclusion in that community, because what it did was undermine trust. And then I go through the history of the relationship between um, Orthodox Jewish communities in New York City, 
and the state to show that systematically the state has gone in and undermined any possibility for trust building between um, communities that live on the margins and the state and suggest that if we're really serious about political inclusion, then what the procedure for engaging with these communities will have to be more respectful of the cultural and religious traditions that they hold. Uh, and that it's only through a respect for the traditions that a kind of political trust can be, uh, the trust can be, um, can emerge. And then po further political conversations would be possible. So in the case of the Orthodox Jews, had New York State engaged in a good faith, in, in good faith, um, good faith earlier, uh, is my contention, then they would have been more likely to gain gain uptake with respect to COVID protection measures in New York City when they were required to come. But already the relations of distrust were so strong that it was not possible for cooperation in a moment of crisis. Um, and then I conclude the book by saying um, we should have a shared public culture um, and that it's possible to do that without, and by shared public culture, I mean that there should be a, a cultural space that is distinctly Australian, that is distinctly Canadian, that is distinctly Italian, that is distinctly Kenyan, where um, people can participate in that public culture as, a, as sort of a, an element of belonging to the community. And I describe what the content of that culture would be. Um, and I make the case that it is possible to describe that content in a way that is not exclusionary towards immigrants towards people with diverse um, cultural and religious practices. And then I say, I've proven my case and there's no chance that Peter will come up with anything that will undermine it. That's how I end. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Patty. Um, obviously, we disagree, which is which is why I wrote the book. Um, but just thanks uh, to you first, also for for being the one driving this, driving the idea behind the book, which which was great. Um, love working with you. Yeah, your energy's been fantastic. Um, and apparently, at our university, they're going to crack down on sabbaticals. So you, we are, you were a great example of the fact that a sabbatical in Ottawa uh, in 2018 uh, brought out a lot of research. So uh, yes, I should t take this back to them. But also thanks to uh, Sahana for organising today. Um, thanks to Celine for coming up with the idea. And uh, thanks to Kim, who's going to speak after me, for agreeing to launch the book. We're really lucky to, to have you um, for the, my, my second book launch in a row where Kim Rubenstein is, is, is launching, which is fantastic. So thank you. Um, I won't argue here directly against Patty uh, and her point that the book is actually, uh, which I should have that sit there. Um, I can hand it around here, those want to see it. It's, it's written in uh, a for and against fashion where Patty lays out her position, I lay out mine, and then we respond to each other. So there's a whole section in it where I say, this is why Patty's exactly wrong. And there's a whole section where she says, this is why Peter's exactly wrong. Uh, but today I think we'll just do a kind of more, what it says, positive, positive arguments and maybe in question time we can talk about that. Um, so the book itself is about minority rights, uh, whether there should be multi, uh, multi uh, minority rights. Um, and that's a question that I directly, uh, I, I, I directly address. Um, so my section of the book is called Against, Min Against Multicultural Minority Rights. Um, and quite simply, my argument is that minorities should not be treated differently to majorities. Um, neither majorities nor minorities should have special treatment. And it's basically a very, hopefully, straightforward liberal argument. And this is the idea that any, the claim of anybody, any individual to follow the unique uh, ways of life are, are as important as anybody else. We all have equal claims on following our unique ways of life. Um, no one has a claim to special treatment. In fact, the special treatment that multiculturalists such as Patty argue for in the form of minority rights, that, that's, that special treatment is only justified because the majority are in some way privileged. Um, so if the majority didn't enjoy some sort of special privilege, then we wouldn't need uh, a countering of minority rights. So basically, my, this is pretty, this leads pretty much to my, my main argument, which is that if we remove this majority privilege, then we do no longer need minority rights. So we only need minority rights because of majority privilege. Remove majority privilege, wacko, uh, no need for minor minority rights. That's, that's pretty much what I'm going to say here. Um, I'll expand on it, but that, that's my main argument. So the problem that multiculturalists such as Patty, who argue for minority rights, seek to address is the fact that the majority have shaped the institutions in their image. They've shaped them to their advantage. 
So as she, she gave some examples before, but when we look at things like courts, schools, hospitals, militaries, police, government departments, dress codes, safety regulations, these sorts of things, they favour the majority way of life. And when we see this, we start to see claims for uh, ways of helping minorities uh, to, to also follow their ways of life. So she's given some examples, but the classic ones are things like turban wearing Sikhs, uh, trying to work in construction sites or ride motorbikes, Jews and, and Muslims are uh, finding that the humane slaughtering laws don't allow them to slaughter animals in the way that they, that, that they think is religiously appropriate. So there's a certain dominant ways of doing things around here which don't easily accommodate people to do things differently. So just to repeat, claims for minority rights almost always arise because there's some institutional background that favours majorities and makes it harder for minorities to do things they want to do. Um, of course, a certain way of doing things around here is going to be unavoidable. There will always be some certain way of doing things around here. But my, my point is that why should it be the certain way of doing things here that was decided behind the majority, if we're liberals, we need some other independent justification. Perhaps for efficiency reasons there's, or, or for safety reasons, there will be a certain way of doing things around here. But I suggest that it shouldn't necessarily be because it's, because it's a privileging, a privileging of the majority way of life. So even though I, my section of the book is against um, multicultural minority rights, I'm not against uh, minority accommodation at all. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, I support those that want to do things that are difficult to achieve uh, because, uh, because of the background institutions favouring the majority. Um, but as I say, instead of arguing for minority rights to counter this relative disadvantage, I instead argue for removing uh, the advantage that's given to majorities. So in other words, introduce a slightly more technical term, I argue for neutral institutions. I think we should have neutral institutions. Um, what do I mean by neutrality? Here, it's basically the idea of showing no relative favour or disfavour to, to the things that are going to be treated neutrally. In this way, people's ways of life. In this case, people's ways of life. So neutral institutions should not favour anyone's way of life, whether they're majority or minority. Um, so an institution, for example, could be neutral between people's religions by supporting all the religions equally or supporting no religions whatsoever. Now... What's interesting, and I have a whole section of the book on this, at least it's interesting to me, is that multiculturalists often say, we're not about neutrality at all. Uh, we're anti-neutrality. Neutrality is the problem. I have a whole chapter on the book uh, which says actually multiculturalists are arguing for neutrality as well. They just argue for, I think, the wrong kind of neutrality, and that's what I want to try and show you. So what I suggest is that when it comes to, uh, when it's realised that, uh, one of our institutions is favouring majority ways of life. Um, we have a failure of neutrality. We need to do something about it. We have two choices. We have uh, the multicultural minority rights way of dealing with it, um, which I think is neutralising, even though they often don't say so. Um, it's a neutralising effect. Um, and that is, OK, we've got favour going on uh, in this sense. We need some sort of minority rights to recognise minorities and give them something so that it counters this majority advantage. Or I suggest, once again, a technical term, what I call active indifference. The label doesn't matter so much as the concept. And this is the idea that when we realise there's a failure of neutrality, uh, we simply remove majority, whatever the majority privilege is, and open up the range that that institution is, is neutral to, to open it up to more people. I think examples probably help best here. So let me give the example, another classic example of police uniforms. As most of us living in the West will have seen, uh, for a long time, there was a standard police uniform, uh, but waves of migration meant that uh, people, many people found there were barriers to entry, to entering the police, classically Sikhs and Muslims, um, and that they, they felt they couldn't enter the police because of, because of headwear or, or, or facial hair requirements. Um, this was met by the police, uh, most, most police in Western jurisdictions, uh, granting exemptions, saying if you're a Muslim or a Sikh, you can wear a, diff you can wear the, a hat in a different colour or you can be allowed to wear a beard if you are a Muslim or a Sikh. Um, so this is an exemption. This is an example of a multicultural minority right being given. Um, you, you need to meet some certain requirements and then you can do this other thing. What I want to suggest is that the police seem to still be doing their job, perhaps even better, but that might be due to more anti-corruption, I don't know, uh, but they're at least doing, doing their job in some places, maybe worse in other places, actually, the more I think about it. Uh, but they, they're still able to do their job. This hasn't stopped them. It hasn't stopped their purpose at all. So what I suggest is if this is the case, 
why not just uh, open this up to everyone? Why not just say, we're now opening up. Uh, the police the police can wear, if you join the police, you can have a beard. Not, you don't have to be a Sikh, for example. If you join the police, you can have a whole, you can wear these other sort of headwear. There's no name to mark out a particular group who can claim this right. Um, it's an opening up, it's a neutralizing effect. Um, another example is elections. Um, lots of countries, including Australia, where most of us are listening from today, have elections on Saturdays. Classically, this would be seen as a problem for Orthodox Jews who uh, wouldn't want to vote on Saturdays because it's the Sabbath. Um, so here we have, once again, these two competing options, the multicultural minority rights option, the one that uh, multicultural such as Patty should be arguing for, and active indifference. So the multicultural minority rights people will say, well, we've got a problem for Orthodox Jews. How are we going to neutralise this? Well, we should grant them an exemption. We should say Jews, Orthodox Jews should be allowed to vote on a different day through postal voting or pre-poll voting. The active indifference approach is to say, okay, we have a problem here. What are we going to do about it? Well, why don't we just say, uh, why don't we just make sure that this privilege of this idea of Saturday voting is not beholden to everyone, it's opened up to more people. Why don't we just say anyone who feels they have that they can't vote on Saturday should be able to pre-poll or postal vote. What's important to note here, and many of you will probably realise, this is exactly what we do. We already, we don't, we don't grant exemptions to Orthodox Jews for Saturday voting. We just say, if you feel you have a good reason, uh, go and vote uh, in another way. So we already do this. So the idea, my argument for active indifference, taking away this privileging, opening up the, the space for more people is in fact a practical solution that, that states already do. And I suggest we can do it in more places, for example, like in the police uniform example. So active indifference is the idea, is intended to capture that an institution should be indifferent between the range of lives that those who are subject to this institution. Importantly, the reason I call it active is it can't simply be set and forget. It's a constant ongoing monitoring and a constant ongoing monitoring of seeing, is this institution neutral? Um, is it, is it uh, unfairly privileging majorities? Can we change it in some way? Just briefly, um, this is a comparative claim. It's comparing one form of neutrality to another. So I need to tell you why it's better than the other way. The minority rights approach, this has active indifference has at least two types of advantages over minority rights. And the first is that the risks and costs of minority rights can mainly be avoided. These risks and costs are not just put forward by those of us like myself who argue against minority rights, but they're accepted by those who argue for minority rights. Um, this is the idea that it's really hard to work out who exactly is a member of a group. When you give a minority right, who do we, who do we work out who's in the group? Is it because they feel they're a member of the group? Is it because there's some objective list? Um, is it because some spokesperson has said, yes, you are actually a member of this group? This is the problem that needs to be solved by those who argue for minority rights. We also have a problem of what sort of groups count when we're looking at giving rights to people who feel like they've been, uh, they can't enjoy a particular institution. Uh, do we give it just to people with religious based differences, consciously held beliefs? Is it that something that's unalterable? Um, what do we do here? This is the problem that needs to be solved. And once again, recognised by those who argue for minority rights. As well, those who know this literature better will know that some recognition of rights, when you actually say this is the group of people who are, who are allowed these rights, it fixes their identity. It can construct their identity. Um, and their identity can be shaped. We know their identity can be shaped politically. To use the terms that often you to be people, they, their identities can be reified or essentialised. And finally, we know, um, particularly from the, but not only from the pioneering work of Susan moller -Oken, that minorities within minorities can be left more vulnerable once we sort of start, start recognising our, our, our minority rights. Um, active indifference, the, the, the argument I make, is avoids these problems because we don't need to name particular groups. We don't need to have a fine grained distinction of who gets this right or not. We simply open up the space. But also that's the kind of negative advantage, if you like. The positive advantage of active indifference is that it provides more freedom for all of us. As I said at the beginning, this is a clearly liberal argument. Freedom matters. This is not a zero sum game. So if we go back to the voting example and Orthodox Jews, the, the active indifference approach, allowing everybody who feels that they can to vote to pre-poll or postal vote um, accommodates Orthodox Jews. They can now vote alongside everyone else, but it accommodates more people too. It accommodates the rest of us who uh, may, may have to work on Saturdays uh, or may uh, 
may have a lot of children's sport, which is how I feel at the moment on Saturdays and get trouble getting there, or, or maybe away, whatever it can be. All of us have this freedom. It's not a zero-sum game. It's not something like we just, we, it's not a zero-sum game when it comes to giving this particular right. So those concerned with minority disadvantage and accommodation have generally seen neutrality as an enemy, um, as a false principle that simply maintains the status quo and its power of everybody else. But as I hope to have shown here, Neutrality is not conservative. It's a radical principle that can tear at majority privilege and open up the way for minority of accommodation. Um, multicultural minority rights are targeted specific groups, but multicultural accommodation does not need to be targeted at all. Our institutions already change and adapt to accommodate our needs without targeting specific groups. What I've called active indifference is not only possible, um, but we see it in practice right now. Our institutions can and have adapted and change to accommodate new needs and desires and continue to properly serve their purpose. When this happens, we avoid the problems of minority rights that I listed before, and there's more freedom for all of us. Thank you. That's fine, Kim. Hi. Um, thank you so much, um, Peter, and thank you, Patty. Um, over to Kim now, who will speak to the significance of this book um, and formally launch this book. Wonderful. Thank you, Sahana, and thank you to you again for organising this, to Selene for inviting, um, for you and Selene for inviting me to be involved. And as Peter said, there is a particular joy in being involved in another um, uh, Peter output or Peter um, creation, but this time one which is shared. And Patty, great to meet you in this context. Um, and congratulations to you both on a number of levels. It speaks in many ways to a lot of the areas of work that I am trying to promote, which is about shared um, shared work in the in a broader sense. And shared scholarship is um, a very apposite example of how important and valuable it is in. Um, in the broader sense of inclusion and participation in community to model, um, to model shared work. And this book is a testament to that. I think the other um, broader significance of the book in that same spirit is about changing the way we think about exercising power in society. And not only through shared work, but a civilized engaged um, discussion that surrounds or that revolves around disagreement is a very healthy representation of the importance of good public policy to be developed by virtue of the fact that we don't necessarily always agree, but that disagreement does not have to lead to fragmentation, but rather that disagreement can in fact provide frameworks for greater social inclusion, social engagement, and the, the word of activity here in terms of in the opposite of active, active indifference, what I would say an active citizenship that really does promote a more socially cohesive society. And perhaps that will be one of the normative aspects we, we might come back to in our discussion. But in, ter in terms of talking about the significance of this contribution beyond the shared work and the significance of the contribution in terms of modelling positive disagreement that can lead to very positive outcomes for a community, I think it really is very helpful to situate your discussion and this book in terms of the historical trajectory of multicultural discussion. And indeed the book's introduction opens by saying that, you know, multiculturalism has become a political touchstone in many countries. And marking that around the rise of Islam and the influence of, um, of um, greater Islamic communities in Europe and the backlash that has uh, flown from it. But then immediately after that recognition, and I think for those of us sitting here in Australia reflecting on the Australian experience, we all know very well that, of course, that is just another step along a long history of the state's involvement with difference. And in fact, picking up the Jewish theme that seems to have evolved in terms of my own um, reflections personally beyond the professional that I'll come back to, but personally being a sixth generation Australian Jewish woman whose ancestor goes back to Henry Cohen, one of the first Jewish convicts to arrive in Australia. In many ways, the state was engaging with difference right from the start. And indeed, when he was finally pardoned um, and um, became a member of the um, Free Settlers, 
a community that his wife and 10 children had started soon after he'd arrived as an indentured labourer. He became very active in the Jewish community in Australia, enabling the Jewish community to both be very um, strongly identifying as British subjects as they were, but then also to maintain their own specific um, uh, religious practices in terms of keeping kosher and having spe special burial rites and so forth. And he was an active participant there. And so historically, from a religious sense, at the very least, we see in Australia the state engaging with those notions right from the uh, the colonial beginning. And at that note, I should and do want to acknowledge, of course, um, that we are each sitting on Indigenous country and to pay our respects to elders I'm sitting today um, in Wurundjeri country having um, needed to, to access this today from, um, from Melbourne unexpectedly. But a recognition also that um, the state did not recognise right from the start um, Indigenous Australians and the move which I'll come back to and circle back to at the end to the Uluru Statement from the Heart might be a way of also engaging further in this discussion. But more broadly, in terms of my professional engagement with these ideas, it's through the frame of citizenship and indeed citizenship becomes another lens through which we can assess the competing discussions that Peter and Paddy's arguments provide for us in this book. And in many ways, the historical evolution of citizenship in Australia does also mirror um, and reflect upon Australia's evolution in terms of its multicultural policy. Um, yet, at the same time, a resistance, which I'll also come back to. But certainly in terms of how the state engages with these issues, citizenship um, and legislation around citizenship, not to mention constitutional points that I'll come back to at the very end, provide a very helpful um, form of analysis for the pros and cons of the discussion of whether we want a neutral state or whether we want an active state promoting diversity. And the citizenship test, um, which was introduced in 2007, which was the first time a test had been, a formal test had been introduced, really was another response to a backlash against multicultural policy in Australia with the rise of terrorism and concerns about how well multicultural policy was evolving. The state took an active step of introducing a new hurdle for individuals to become citizens. And that does reflect on those different lenses. Um, and the question would be, how indifferent is that test in relation to um, the requirements to pass the test? And again, it has a legacy in Australian history in terms of multiculturalism, because of course, Australia was part of a movement of, of introducing dictation tests right from the very beginning of the Migration Act in 1901. And the famous case, Egon Kish, who what was a neutral test, and so in line of Peter's arguments of providing a test that anyone had to, um, to pass, Egon Kishu spoke seven languages, was um, given a, a test in Gaelic as a way of keeping him out. And ultimately, the High Court found that unlawful. And, and again, we could unravel that in terms of the neutral state versus the engaged state. Um, but the citizenship test, which continues to this um, very day, is part, I think, of the ongoing tension that we see in Australia around multicultural policy. And I don't want to speak too much longer here, but again, if we go back to the structures of our institutional frameworks to really test out how neutral they are or how active they are in promoting diversity, we only have to um, start again with our constitutional underpinnings. And this might be the point that could be helpful to open up the discussion and bring it back to um, circumstances here, Patty, which privileged um, Peter's engagement, but your theoretical engagement with this as well will be really um, important. But we have um, a section of the constitution which, which basically states, despite the evolution of the acceptance of dual citizenship in Australia in a legislative sense, we have the ongoing section of the constitution which says that a person who holds another citizenship cannot even nominate to be an active citizen, cannot put their hand up to just even be considered to be elected at one of those elections where voting is generally held on a Saturday. 
And with a society that now the most recent ABS statistics show that over 50% of Australians um, are either born outside of Australia or their parents are born outside of Australia, um, speaking to what would, one would say a very successful multicultural uh, immigration policy in terms of the, the diversity, the lived diversity of um, Australian citizens today, there is a hurdle um, in relation to those individuals being able to participate. Now, a neutral stance would say, well, everybody has that same um, uh, requirement. Um, and so it's the substantive difference for dual citizens that um, raises the question of how inclusive that is and has ramifications, I would argue, in relation to our parliamentary framework, which provides the political environment to have these more engaged discussions as who is in the room in our parliament to then engage from the lived experience of um, the supposedly neutral laws impact on their lives. And certainly during COVID, um, I was um, an advocate for saying it is a representation of the failure of the neutrality of the state because during COVID when our borders were shut and Australian citizens were stranded outside of Australia or the 50% of Australians who could not actually go and visit their family outside of Australia because they were trapped by supposedly neutral policies that applied to everyone, that not having sufficient voices of those Australians um, who we would say make up our diverse society limited the discussion that led to the outcomes, the supposedly neutral outcomes. And on that notion of neutrality and taking it outside of Australia, and perhaps, Patty, this um, example might speak more to your own knowledge, um, is a, a case that was in the United States um, that I became involved with as a member of an amicus submission of scholars of statelessness um, where citizenship law, and again, finally bringing it back to citizenship as, the, as a frame for thinking about multiculturalism. Um, there was a citizenship case that flowed from what were overtly non-neutral laws in relation to gender, but it comes back to perhaps testing out, Peter, these notions of neutrality. Um, the law had that any um, child born outside of the US to a, a US citizen parent, there was a distinction if your US citizen parent was a male or your father as opposed to your mother. And there was an advantage for those who were born of US citizen mothers outside of the US that their road to citizenship within the US was only over a two-year period in terms of a residence requirement, whereas children of US fathers born outside of Australia had an eight-year wait. And interestingly, the wonderful Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who um, authored the majority judgment, found that that was unconstitutional, but in the neutral sense of, um, of reducing majority rights, which is what Peter's argument is saying, uh, as part of Peter, your argument in relation to the creating neutrality, the judgment found that it was unconstitutional, but uh, rather than giving the child, who was the applicant in this case of the father, the advantage that had been the advantage of the mothers. The court sent it back to the Congress to say both children would be subject to the more disadvantaged requ disadvantageous requirement of eight years. And so that was an attempt of um, active um, indifference or active um, pronouncement that was about taking away the, the privileged rights rather than giving the minority rights. And I think, again, it becomes a really int uh, interesting question about what the substantive impact of neutrality is um, for those whose lived experience has always been differentiated or othered. And I guess, finally, to bring it back to us, that becomes questions both um, in an Indigenous framework for the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and I'd be very keen to hear Peter's response from a neutral level as to whether a step towards a changed um, constitutional um, commitment to hearing the specific voice of First Nations Australians, not in a determinative way, but in a way to enable their participation in a more meaningful way speaks to or against your um, proposed model 
And in relation to dual citizenship, Paddy, which um, is an issue that perhaps is not just only within Australia, but in other countries, whether those structural frameworks, which may appear neutral, um, actually do privilege certain groups by virtue of the fact that the that the institutions and the power that power of frameworks that create the institutions can never really be neutral. And I'll leave it at that as a way of opening up the discussion. But congratulations to you both on a really important contribution to the scholarship.